I'm going to speed up at uh, one or other point uh, because uh, you all saw me in Amman. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Germany. Uh, to the German students, thank you for inviting me, uh, especially to Professor Martin Sauer. Um, I'm going to say something a little bit about uh, sustainable architecture and uh, sustainable design as we experience it in the practice, um, what sort of challenges uh, we come across and um, how it all works together. Uh, to myself, to start with, um, I'm Johannes Stühler. I come from uh, Lübeck, which is right in the north uh, of Germany. Uh, lots of um, whoops, lots of places with U. Um, <laughs> just to, to confuse you, to, to make sure you know you're in uh, Germany. Um, I live in a historic. Actually, I should have put in a, a um, sheet and show a photo. I live in a historic building in the really old part of Lübeck, which, uh, thanks to Martin's help, has been renovated and redeveloped to something close to Passive House. Um, I'm somewhere around uh, 20 um, kilowatts. Uh, just a quick um, one or two words about uh, the office I work for. Uh, again, lots of uh, complicated German words. Peters and Perks and Partner. Um, about 85 people working in the office. Um, most of us architects. Um, there are five partners. Um, since Christmas last year. We're situated here in, where is it there, in Lübeck, um, in the north. We're expanding, we're getting uh, bigger throughout Germany, um, but we have to because we're specialized in uh, public buildings, that is hospitals, town halls, and schools. School is, schools are a topic that um, I've been working with for the past uh, five years approximately. Um, and because uh, you reach a point where you've already redeveloped all the schools in your town that we have to uh, expand. Um, and our newest project is here in Leipzig, which is, doesn't even have a red dot yet because it's brand new. Now I'll just show you one. The projects I'm going to be talking about are uh, Hanover, uh, Hamburg, and Brunsbüttel. Uh, Brunsbüttel up here is uh, on the North Sea coast, so we've got completely different weather <laughs> conditions there. We have to deal with a lot of wind. That's uh, a big issue. Mm -hmm. So what do you do if you're uh, asked to design um, a school um, and how you have, what you have to deal with when you <coughs> want to redevelop it? Uh, what the questions that we ask uh, our clients to start with, uh, what's the basis of the brief? How many students? How many <coughs> classes? What school type makes a big difference if we're dealing with a primary school, secondary school? Um, what sort of work are they going to be involved with? Do they move a lot? That makes a difference. Um, <coughs> lots and lots of questions, but also what sort of an energy standard are we trying to achieve with the with the design or the redevelopment. Um, obviously, the, the brief, the client, and uh, the fixed conditions, that is the things, the conditions that we can't change, we have no influence on, uh, make uh, the design different. And the variable conditions, those are the conditions that we can change, that we actually integrate into the design. Um, how do we approach the building? What sort of orientation can we change? The rooms set from the brief, but can we change the orientation to, to um, optimize it? Obviously, we've got to deal with the local building regulations uh, in any case. These differ slightly from uh, the region in Germany. We've got uh, national building regulations. We've got uh, local building regulations uh, that are set by the county or the town. And we have very local uh, building regulations that set how tall is a building going to be, uh, um, how is it accessed, and et cetera. <clears throat> Maybe you already in this design phase have some ideas about what it's going to look like, positive and negative. Maybe you don't want it to look like this. We're talking about energy design. 
uh, something as a designer uh, I'd like to avoid if possible. I'm going to start with uh, the Goethe Schule, um, a redevelopment and extension of a school in Hanover. Here you can see our new part. I hope it's obvious that this is the new part and the old part. Uh, this is the aula, which is the big uh, hall where the students meet for concerts, but also if there's just an assembly. This is what the entrance hall looks like from the inside. So you can see the aula uh, in the background. Uh, a very, I try and use a very small palette of materials and colors. Um, so here we've got uh, tiles on the floor and fair face concrete. I've seen uh, some fair face concrete here in Koblenz as well. Um, something that's been proven very durable is we um, structure the fair face concrete. This is concrete that's been uh, faced with uh, oriented strand board, OSB platter. Um, because um, I'm always surprised where the students and the, the pupils manage to put shoe prints on the wall. If you paint the wall white, you have shoe prints uh, next to the door in two meters height. I don't know how you do that, but they do. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, next to the, the entrance hall. This is the, the classroom uh, or the classrooms um, where we've got walls reaching to the facade. I've got uh, purple uh, uh, metal um, facade elements and uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Inside, again, the very limited and reduced uh, choice of materials. I'll go back one. We've got um, aluminium and wooden uh, windows and inside uh, just one color if I can just one color to uh, make sure the students don't fall asleep in the classroom. So what do we actually do? This is what the school looked like when we started the design phase. Um, I lovingly called it the aeroplane with the wings and the fuselage uh, at the back. Um, built in 1954, so they do have insulation, but very little. Uh, they do have a heating, but it's an old system. So we needed to renovate the whole building and uh, look at the energy. We started off by uh, extending the building. Originally, they wanted us to renovate the whole school in use as meaning that the, the students still have uh, classrooms, still have lessons while we're renovating bit for bit. So we started by extending. Um, then we want to tear down a lot of it. Now the whole school is moving into uh, an empty school close by, so we've now got the chance to tear down all of that uh, lighter green. And then we're going to renovate what's left of it and extend these bits. So you've got a school in the end which is about 75% new, and uh, we've renovated the, the last quarter. That's the... the um, the brief that we have a lot uh, that's combined renovation and uh, new build. This is what the master plan looks like. Um, here you can see in detail that we've got some interior courtyards. Uh, we've got a sports hall and you can, now uh, we can't see it very well, but this building here has an angle because outside of the picture we've got uh, a road here and a bit further out uh, to the east, we've got railway lines. Um, I'll go back one. So this is the project that we uh, finished 2014 and that we've actually measured and uh, we can use as a basis for the following design and we can uh, see actually what impact and what, uh, how our passive house new build actually works. So, um, you might recall the film that, the very short film that Martin showed in um, Aman, the passive house idea. So, he has lots of uh, points and they all work together as a whole to create the passive house. First being the proper insulation, then no air leakages and no thermal bridges. 
So what do we do to actually achieve these goals? I'm calling these challenges because it actually seems quite easy uh, and it makes sense as a whole, but when you're dealing with it, you do discover that they're challenges. This is the outer wall. So what uh, do we have? What do we need? We've got the load-bearing wall. We've got a floor slab and some sort of uh, covering. Normally, the uh, wall would go down and have a big foot at the end and be slightly thinner uh, in the middle because you want to take down the load or deal with the load that's coming down uh, at the heaviest point. But in a passive house, it'll look slightly different. You've got the thermal insulation. Um, when you're dealing with a passive house, this is thick insulation. We're talking about 24 centimeters um, or um, high, uh, um, very good, high quality uh, thermal insulation. You might get a little bit less than that, but um, you're then coming to the limit of what uh, the industry delivers because uh, you need insulation underneath. This can't be any normal insulation. It has to be insulation that can take the load of the whole building. The whole building is standing on the insulation because what's the use of having a woolly jacket on top if, you don't have, uh, if you've got flip-flops underneath? So you want the insulation to go right around the bottom. And that's the reason that the floor slab is just a big rectangle and doesn't have a, a foot at the end because you don't want to do all that meandering with the insulation. We, you need a, a weather cover in front of the insulation. The insulation is not what the building should look like in all. And uh, we've used, in this uh, particular case, we used face brickwork, but the face brickwork doesn't just stand there by itself. It needs to be connected to the load-bearing wall in this case, um, it's done that with little uh, metal wires, but they have to be long enough to go through the insulation, through the, the finger-wide finger gap, um, and <clears throat> they have to be strong enough to take up all sorts of load wind, uh, wind loads um, horizontally. But you don't want the uh, brickwork to hang on that, so they need a foundation just like the rest of the building so that they don't... Uh, sag differently and they get a foundation, nice big foundation uh, underneath and the same insulation again so that they don't uh, sag differently. They are thermal bridges yeah. because um, especially because the thicker the insulation becomes the thicker the wire has to be, or the stronger the wire has to be, or the more you need per square meter, and then you can't, you end up having to work it out um, either as a percentage um, or you calculate it bit for bit. In this case, because everything else is worked out as a package, we can do it as, a, as an overall um, pauschal. Uh, we, had, uh, we have uh, polyurethane uh, insulation. I think we had 22 centimeters. Then comes the, the outside design um, with which we don't always have something to do with. And this is how we built it. The only difference being that the insulation is slightly longer, so it's founded on both sides properly and we put a slight slope on the front of the foundation so that the water that gets in between the floor slab and the wall can run out. There's no other uh, uh, covering the insulation from the house? Uh, no, uh, between the insulation and the, uh, the, the concrete. Mm -hmm. No, we don't need that. What we did do, though, um, either you need to uh, surface the ground underneath the insulation um, or you can put some some uh, some very simple concrete to just flatten it so that you've got a surface like a screed uh, just so you've got a surface to, to lay the, the um, insulation on this is uh, these are some pictures of what it actually looks like when uh, when building here you can see 
the fair face uh, uh, brickwork, the finger gap and the insulation. And here we have, uh, you might remember, over the windows we've got a, a concrete, fair face concrete uh, stripe, strip that is, uh, that then carries the load of the wall above. I'll get to that in a little bit. Here you can see the uh, stripe of concrete. Another challenge is sunscreen. We doesn't look like it uh, now, but we do have sun. We do have to deal with it at schools. Um, the sunscreen is not only uh, help, uh, helps let out the sun in terms of um, solar gain, but it also um, is um, uh, reflection, stops reflection when you're working with either with the beamer or computers, uh, the glare. <coughs> This is typically what uh, uh, the, uh, the wall would look like if we didn't have uh, the sunscreen. So you've got the wall going down to uh, ideally the, the bottoms, bottom of the, the ceiling inside the rooms. And you need to somehow hide the insulation because we don't like uh, the insulation on the outside. Then if you would do it with louvers, louvers are very big, but we still need the insulation behind the louvers. They need to overlap with the, the insulation of the window, but suddenly we don't have room for the, for the brickwork in front. So what we in this case had to do is go to a different system, uh, in this case uh, a cloth sunscreen, it's actually made out of uh, a woven polyurethane uh, material and we had to get the best and highest powering uh, insulation possible uh, to overlap between the window and the uh, wall. Um, in the different design stages, we even considered using uh, VIP um, vacuum insulation panels as uh, thermal insulation, which is very, very expensive and because I'm not sure if you know the material, it looks like vacuum packed uh, coffee. Uh, it comes in little silver um, packages and it's actually under a vacuum. That means there's no air at all in it. Uh, it has an extremely good uh, U value, but as soon as somebody on the building site walks over it with the wrong shoes or bends it too much, they could, uh, an, an air leakage can occur and suddenly it goes pshh not leaking out air, but sucking in air, and suddenly it doesn't have the, the insulation quality that you want. Here again, what we ended up detailing um, with the, the louver, uh, the sunscreen there, again, the concrete slab, and the wall in front of that. <coughs> Another challenge is the roof. Um, in this case, uh, politically um, necessary, they decided, uh, Hanover's decided to have all of the schools, first of all, passive house, which is obvious because that's what we're dealing with here, but also they wanted uh, extensively uh, greened roof, which means that uh, we have, uh, there's, there's a substrate, there's something growing on the roof, but we have to deal with that in terms of the load because you not only have the, the, um, the snow and the rain on the roof, but you've also got uh, in this case, you've got green plants that always store a little bit of water. So again, what are the basics? Here we've got the, the, uh, the roof construction, the, the ceiling slab, an upstand beam. Then you've got a lot of insulation. This is uh, not only due to the, the passive house that we've got thick insulation, but it's also because we need to have a slope in it to, uh, to channel the water away from or towards the, the rain pipe. In this case, because we know we're, we're going to um, uh, build in further stages, going to build around this particular um, uh, building, we had internal rain pipes. That's very unusual for a passive house because you need to insulate the water, the cold water. You don't want to channel that through the building. Um, that's very unusual. <coughs> Normally you'll have an external uh, rain pipe. So this way the uh, slope of, uh, of insulation is going away from the facade. 
So what we wanted to avoid uh, with uh, avoid on the uh, floor slab is taking the insulation for a walk. We have to do that here because we've got that upstand beam. So we've got the insulation running all the way around the outside. Again here, the uh, fair, fair faced uh, brickwork on the outside. And then we've got uh, a cover over the attica so that the insulation doesn't get wet and isn't weathered on. And the green uh, roof with a little gravel edge so that the green doesn't end up growing underneath into the attica and causing new building problems. This is how we do it. And we've got two uh, um, foils to deal with uh, the water. One as the bottom layer in case water gets through the, the insulation and the outer one, which is in this case uh, saved by the, uh, the green and the gravel on top, so it's not weathered on. Another challenge, this is more of a topic for the, uh, the engineers, but um, I'm not sure on the first picture you saw these holes in the cupboards. Well, this is uh, for what uh, Dr. Feist uh, told about in the short film, uh, heat recovery. So we have uh, ventilation for every classroom. In this case, because the building is only, only has two floors, we can do it vertically. In this case, where you see in this room where we've got the sink, we have a cupboard that has a vertical pipe and has the ventilation um, inside the building over the roof. If the building ends up having more floors, you might have to reconsider that because the ducts are going to take up a lot of room and you might consider having the ventilation over a uh, wall or outer wall mounted um, ventilators. So this is what it actually does. That's the cupboard we just saw. It <coughs> takes away the uh, used air from the, the students, from the pupils, uh, and sucks in fresh air over the roof um, through the uh, heat recovery, um, a lot of the heat uh, Seventy-five percent in our case, I think, it was eighty-three or eighty-five percent heat recovery. So it's pre-warmed when the air comes uh, back in. This is very important because we've got to deal with uh, the different criteria. We've got temperature, the air quality. That's actually the main aspect for school. We don't want to use up uh, all of the air and humidity. The humidity is actually something that. Uh, uh, on the single family house might be uh, dealt with. In schools we've got a big problem with um, hygiene so that we don't actually pre-humidify uh, the air into the classroom. We just use the air as it comes. That does mean that we've got, um, that we've got very dry air in the winter. And the heating actually we need, in these, uh, in these classrooms, you really need uh, heating with about 2,500, 2,400 watts. But if you consider that every pupil produces 100 watt and you've got 30 pupils, you're actually dealing with uh, neutral. You're not actually uh, pumping any uh, heat into the building. Uh, and in fact, um, we've uh, noticed that the heating uh, that we actually want to turn off the heat recovery from May till October. So a long time before the summer holidays, uh, you just want fresh air from the outside and not preheated air. Lots of sexy technical drawings um, <laughs> with what it looks like. In detail, you can see here's the, the classroom. That's the board we're standing in front of. Uh, the sink with the little green wall behind it, but this is the cupboard with the holes in it and the ducts running uh, in the ceiling. That's actually the hardest thing for us to deal with. We're uh, dealing with a building or an extension of a building, so we've got fixed heights. We can't say we're going to do the building a meter 50 higher. So it's a real, or for us, it was a real tight squeeze uh, uh, delivering or uh, mounting the ducts underneath the ceiling with still enough room to uh, mount the ceiling underneath. So
So uh, when we're actually dealing with, uh, with the architecture, uh, there are a couple of aspects that we can deliver. It's not just the, the passive house engineer or the energy consultant telling us what to do. There are things that we can do. Um, <clears throat> we've got to do things as well. And there are a couple of things that are a bit of a challenge. So um, I'm not sure on this first picture if any of you noticed these columns here. These columns are load-bearing, and they go from the inside to the outside. Normally, if I design a building new, I'd try and avoid that like anything because it's not going to work that well. So there are different ways uh, to deal with it. <clears throat> you can think about what you would do uh, when you come across a situation like that. So would you insulate the column on all sides, um, which then means that the, the cold has to go right through the bottom of the column into the building. It'll probably lose its momentum on the way. <clears throat> if you think elephants are sexy, then you'll go for A. Uh, leave it the way it is and hope that nothing happens. You don't get mold on the inside. I can say from experience that this uh, uh, aula, this uh, assembly hall, in the winter when they have assembly or they have theater there, Literally, the water is running down the facade. They've actually got a little rain pipe along the facade on the inside because it is so much water. <coughs> so uh, it could go well, but I'm not sure if it will. <coughs> you lift the building up, you cut the, the column, and you replace it with some uh, pressure-resistant insulation. Or D, think about becoming a carpenter or a hairdresser. <coughs> Um, there, isn't, there isn't a right or wrong in any of these. <coughs> um, I do admit that D was a solution for me for a while. I did consider becoming uh, a carpenter at the one or other situation. But these are the challenges that we have to deal with, and I'll come to that a little bit later. So the passive house generally is, uh, is very good. The, the themes that we're following, the, the, the single goals, um, are a very good guideline uh, to help design, but the goals might necessarily be achieved. <coughs> uh, in the case of a school, the ideas can, might have to be uh, rearranged slightly because they were based on a single family house where you have four users maybe, and they know exactly how the ventilation works. They know exactly when uh, the daughter has a shower in the morning, when uh, father goes to work. In a school, you've got too many different usages. They've got, um, you've got, um, uh, you're having a meeting room, you've got extracurricular classes. On Wednesdays, it's a little bit longer than on Thursdays. Um, you've got sport, you have lots and lots of different uses, and it becomes very, very uh, complicated. Plus, if you really take uh, the passive house to the extreme, the weak points become very, very uh, extreme. It's hard to deal with them. And it's hard to control, both in the building phase as later on when the building is in use. We create the building, and often we give it to the, the clients, and we don't know what happens to it afterwards. What we did before we then uh, started the second uh, building phase is we compared the different uh, variants of energy design. So here I'm comparing the passive house, which we actually uh, built the first building phase in, uh, the NF, which is the energy standard that we have to achieve in Germany throughout the whole, whole of Germany anyway, and uh, something in between, which is NF minus 30, which means that we undermine uh, the standard. When we, here we are comparing the different elements. So this is the roof, 100% being what we built. Uh, just building by NF would only be, what does it say there? 40%, so building by the normal standard, which is already very good, would be a lot cheaper. Um, the wall and uh, the floor. There are some ex uh, interesting um, situations here that if I would, if I'm comparing the window, this is the window. The window almost costs the exact same if I do it by passive house or 
by the normal energy standard. Um, so it's possible that you cut corners here and find a system that's slightly optimized. Here we've got uh, the ventilation system where we've got huge percentages. Where is it? Where well, the, the difference here, difference is huge, over 200% because if you're not building a passive house, you might not need the ventilation. You would have a CO2 uh, measuring device and then you ventilate via the facade when necessary. So what we <coughs> come to discover is 100% the passive house as we built it, it would only be, we would only actually save 16% if we would uh, design by normal standard. So what do other, um, is there anything coming? Oh, yeah. uh, so the, the goals uh, can be achieved, um, but they're normally passive, uh, they're normally politically motivated. So the county, the country, or the client says achieve that goal, be it Bream, LEED, or uh, DIG and B, which is not uh, listed here. Um, but there are alternatives, uh, low-tech alternatives, um, because you don't want it all to be serviced. So this is the project in Brunsbüttel. Uh, you might see those columns for the second time here. So in the 70s, obviously, it was very en vogue to have those columns on the outside of the building. Uh, but in this case, the column goes out of the building, into the building, that balcony is part of the load-bearing construction, back out of the building and then up there you can see it through the window again, it's on the inside. <coughs> you don't get uh, thermal bridges better than that. Uh, the school obviously uh, uh, come, come to age, uh, but that's something we have to deal with a lot. A lot of the buildings that we deal with are from the 60s and 70s. Uh, where after the war, the country came to money and decided to build lots of schools. The whole building actually is so complicated that I can't talk you through the, the floor plans. It's got columns out here, it's got uh, uh, fair face concrete, which has been painted, uh, uh, staircases, it's got uh, uh, the meeting room, the aula has got steps, so it's got the, the maximum surface for the minimum uh, um, space inside the exact opposite of what we're going to do or what we would like to do. So the first thing we do is, although the, the uh, school insisted on having these columns on the outside, at least on one floor we tidied up the facade, we can insulate the staircase, but we extended the building on the ground, uh, on the first floor. Here on the technical drawing you can see it a bit easier. Yellow is the uh, old facade, we're taking that down. We're extending the room by about a meter 20, but we're also cleaning up or tidying up the surface of the building. This is uh, a different school in Hamburg. Here again, we've been asked to extend the building um, uh, in, uh, in Hamburg. We are extending it with a new build but we're also extending this building, which is just um, a one-sided uh, hallway. We're extending it by just covering the roof. We're, we're uh, reducing the surface. Uh, easy step. We have to have a little bit of glass in there. And uh, we've got a meeting room inside the building now. But it's a very simple step in terms of reducing the surface of the building. Hamburg, in fact, um, uh, insists or wants to redevelop all their buildings, not only to save energy, but because they think it's part of education. They're trying to teach, uh, actively teaching the students and the pupils how to reduce energy consumption because they think it's part of the curricula. Um, and uh, here we're not, this is uh, the outside of one of the, the neighboring buildings. Hamburg has a special role and it can't, or oh, it's politically decided not to uh, redevelop their buildings or passive house simply because they've got too many. They've got 400 schools with 3,000 buildings. 
if they decide to do that all by passive house or passive house standard, um, they'll be redeveloping uh, for the next probably 50, 50 years. So they want a holistic energy re uh, redevelopment, but they already have discovered that it's unrealistic and uneconomical because if you have to redevelop all those buildings at the same time, you have to, be, you have to uh, pay for them uh, for the next 20 odd years. And they've also discovered that the high end solutions are too complex, again, because of the different usages of the buildings. Uh, it's a theater, it's a meeting room, a clubhouse or a gymnasium. And uh, because they're constantly used differently, a passive house is probably not the solution. Uh, imagine uh, another tutor coming in afterwards and he says, oh, it's really warm in here. He'll open all the windows and suddenly everything that the building's been heating up in the past three quarters of an hour just literally flies out the window. <coughs> Uh, also, the, the amount of technical supply, supplies that you bring into the house, they all need to be serviced, they all need to be maintained, and because they're constantly adapted, they, uh, they can easily malfunction. A lot of the buildings in Hamburg are uh, standard type buildings. This building, we call it the double H, um, they've got lots of these. They've got probably about 20, maybe even 30 buildings of the exact same type through Hamburg, so they've had the chance to actually look at what to do. Um, they're thinking about the long-term costs or intermediate costs and not just quick uh, insulation. Um, in Germany, the past year, polystyrene has become uh, categorized as hazardous waste. So um, we try and avoid that because otherwise you'll be paying for the waste uh, long after um, uh, long after you've been paid for the building. Um, so they concentrate on the weak points. What can we uh, redevelop to get, uh, uh, to make the house more efficient? Uh, Dr. Feist's second point, which is no air leakages. So they're thinking about windows, thinking about doors. Uh, changing those might uh, already reduce the energy, uh, not just uh, thermal insulation. They're working on the heating system, insulation of the floor above the basement, so easy accessible from uh, underneath the base or underneath the, the classrooms. Insulation of the roof, again, accessibility on top of the building and the exchange of windows. Renewable energy, well, the energy, um, if we can't change the actual consumption of the building, we can consider where the, the energy comes from. Um, a lot of the energy uh, could easily come from the sun because a single family house, you, if you have photo, photovoltaic on the roof, you'll gain uh, energy at the times you don't need it. The family needs it in the evening when they want to watch television or they want a hot shower. Um, on a school, it's the exact opposite. Um, the public building in general, uh, it's the ideal for uh, photovoltaic uh, because the school is used during the day when the sun shines and the beamer, the computer we're working on now could run off that. Uh, another thing that we almost always do <coughs> um, is very low tech but works very well is uh, generating some naked thermal mass, in this case the concrete. Um, here we've got concrete walls uh, that work as um, uh, thermal mass in this case as well. And just have windows that can open during the night. So at night, all the heat that's created during the day, us, solar gain, uh, can be thrown out the window during night and cool down. We saw that in the school in Hannover. This is a hospital I did beforehand where we've, we just had some uh, hole-punched uh, aluminium. And that was a building I showed when I was in Amman, a uh, school in Ratzeburg, uh, with some irregular dots. That's actually an aerial picture of the Ratzeburg Azee, which is uh, very local. So how does it all come together? 
Well, we've always got to consider the same things, the brief, the client, the fixed and variable con uh, conditions, and the rules and regulations. And <coughs> every building is still different, but with the clever overall use of the uh, ele elements, everything was used efficiently, even the energy. And when rede redesigning or recreating a building, it's essential that the architect or those designing understand the matter well enough to, to develop a holistic concept together with the other engineers. So if we all work together, it'll bring out a useful and working concept. Thank you. <laughs>